my name is Patrick Higgins. I'm a software engineer at Gremlin. Um, I got into Gremlin pretty early on. I was, uh, I think, engineer or employee number five. Uh, we're now at 50, so we're not, you know, we're not a huge company. Um, but, you know, things are coming along. And today I want to talk initially about chaos engineering. Uh, then I want to talk about how that may or may not affect uh, user experiences and your UIs. And lastly, I want to talk about building more robust uh, React applications uh, with kind of the ideas of chaos engineering in mind. So here's a definition of uh, chaos engineering. Uh, it comes from my CEO, so you know what the boss says goes. Uh, it it's oh no, oh, okay, just went off down there. We're good. Um, so it's the thoughtful planned experiment that uh, chaos engineering is about thoughtful planned experiments designed to reveal weaknesses uh, in our system. So if I go home uh, back to Sydney, Australia and I'm talking to my mum about what I'm doing in San Francisco, I talk about the fact that it's kind of like, case engineering is kind of like vaccination in that you inject some kind of harm into your system um, to essentially build a, a more robust uh, system in general. So that seems really kind of like airy-fairy, like very conceptual, very high level. Um, and the first, to be honest, the first part of this talk will be very much about like, it's, it'll be about principles. So uh, when you think about when, you know, someone comes to me and they're like, I am interested in chaos engineering. That sounds really punk rock. I want to, I want to try it. Um, where do I start? It's like, well, where do you want to start? Like what things, what are, you, what are your problem sets? What are the parts of your complex system um, that you touch on the day-to-day -day basis? Um, how can we go about injecting, uh, injecting failure into those aspects of what's going on? So it could be, you know, uh, at the application level, potentially the UI level, um, could be load balancing, could be uh, at the database level. Um, you know, if it's at the database level, you, things can get really hairy really quickly. Um, potentially at the infrastructure level as well. And we'll kind of like touch on a few of those things as I go through. Um, and it's really important to note that like this idea of chaos engineering is like a practice in the sense that learning a musical instrument is a practice or meditation is a practice or uh, lifting weights is a practice in that you cannot do it like once really, 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 really hard and, um, and see any kind of benefit at all. Uh, it's important that you do it gradually consecutively over a period of time you include it in kind of like uh you you just include it in your like every day or every week it's like something that comes up regularly for you so when we're thinking about injecting failure it follows uh, for chaos engineering it follows a particularly scientific model in that we form a hypothesis around the kind of failure that we're going to inject um, we run the experiment, we inject that kind of failure, and either we're going to get a response from that, from our system, that was expected, or a response that was unexpected. Here it's listed as success or failure, but I think expected and unexpected are probably the way to consider these factors. If it's unexpected, then obviously you want to go and remediate that issue. Like if you... Um, inject some kind of failure and everything falls apart, you probably want to go back and, and remediate that problem. Upon remediating that problem, the idea is that you perform the same experiment and you see the result that you expect next time around. So in doing so, if you continually consecutively go over this process, the idea is that um, you're going to build a more resilient system over time. Um, it's also pretty important to note with this that um, it's not just about improving your systems, but it's also about improving practices. Like some of the results you could see from this when you ask the like, well, why did that all, you know, fall apart? It's the, the response might be, well, we didn't have correct documentation around it. We didn't have a run book for that specific scenario. 
we had nothing to do with that specific situation. And then obviously the remediation from that point of view is more social. It's like, well, let's build systems, like social systems around fixing this issue as well. So, yeah, as I just said, like a lot of this can be associated with things that have happened in the real world and it should be related to basically like real world events. So, you know, I mean, particularly for people working on SPAs, like if, S, if there's an S3 outage, that can be, you know, dramatically painful for all of this. Um, so that's probably a really good example of something that we should actually, um, from an ops perspective, look into and see, like, how can we deal with these situations where potentially there's a region, um, a region that fails, there's some kind of like massive, you know, uh, data center problem. Um, how can we deal with those problems and still present some kind of like uh, successful user experience even when our systems are under duress? So chaos engineering has this concept of game days. What's a game day? So it's dedicated time for teams to collaboratively focus um, on using chaos engineering practices to reveal weaknesses in your services. This this is like um, something that I've really, really enjoyed because it's one of those experiences where you can get um, really like a cross-disciplinary team. Like you could get product managers in the room, you can get UI engineers in the room, you can get DevOps engineers in the room. And you're like all talking about the ways that things are failing and like how you can build successful solutions together. That's like really uh, like at that level, you, you're kind of like addressing things um, in a really like multidisciplinary manner, which I think is really awesome. And I want to talk about now like my first game day, which was kind of traumatic. So um, we we were like, you know, told in advance that uh, we we're going to run our first game day, and uh, I was pretty new at the company as well. Uh, we were working on this uh, really janky EmberJS app, like no no hate. But like it was, it was pretty, it was a pretty rubbish uh, development experience at the time, and um, and I knew this was coming up, but like didn't know what it was going to do. Like spent a lot of time thinking about like error state management, loading state management. Um, obviously, I I kind of like realized that um, uh, if we were going to be injecting failure into our infrastructure level, the the possibility was that the knock-on consequences were going to be that I'd see latency and I'd see exceptions. Um, and th this is obviously the process of going through dog fooding, like the idea of using, oh, yeah, just to, uh, just to step back a second. We were using Gremlin on Gremlin. Uh, that was the idea. So uh, this is something that's like part of the ethos of Gremlin that we, we actually chaos engineer regularly on our chaos engineering tools that we're building. Um, so for us, yeah, this was uh, the idea of injecting entropy into our own systems. And we'd call this like entire experience take down Thursday. Well, it, originally it was failure Fridays, then we had to move it to Thursday. So it was take down Thursdays, which it, like the alliteration's not the same. It's just not there. I gotta, we're gonna figure out some kind of other name for it. So, we went through this process of, uh, of like uh, engineering some chaos and the outcomes that I saw is like a pretty early on UI engineer at this company were a little bit traumatic. Like um, if I had, uh, you know, exception errors, I had a couple of like infinite loading states in particular parts of the app. Um, I had some like uncaught exceptions in certain places, which is a bit naughty. And, um, and then there were, specific situations where it would have made more sense to have like a bit more retry logic um, or just like there were bad error, the bad error messaging in places where um, it would have been better to like really think through like what would have, like really empathize with the user and be like, well, what would the user expect to see in this situation and how can I best guide them towards um, a more productive outcome from them from this, you know, obviously this particularly bad point. So yeah, we got to this idea, I, I started to think about remediation, like how can I as a UI engineer think about giving the customer the best experience possible 
in a situation where our systems were like totally under duress. And it got me thinking about the fact that like at this company, we were talking a lot about um, like dealing with uh, the hostility of, uh, of like distributed systems. But at the same time, like UI engineers have been dealing with hostility from the client, like for, for like the longest period of time, like, um, you know, the browser wars, like dealing with different browsers was like something that we all had to deal with on a regular basis anyway. So this particular co quote comes from a, it actually comes from a web designer, uh, Trent Walton. And I, I just think it's awesome because it applies to everyone. Like cars designed to perform in extreme heat or icy roads, websites should be built to face the realities of the web's inherent variability. Like we're, we've got to build for variability, not just in UI, but also just across the stack. So yeah, here's some of the things we have to deal with, like host, the, the hostile browser environment, uh, potentially like tiny screens, um, slow connection speeds, and just like things that the user will end up doing that we haven't accounted for. And um, so what I, what I found that was really cool was that like in, for the longest time, like I'd been thinking about uh, graceful degradation. But in 2003, this idea of progressive enhancement came out, which was specifically related at the time to um, how to deal with older browsers and then iterate on top of a core set of functionality. And I thought this was like really appropriate for the problem set that I was seeing dealing with um, like some of the values that would be injecting at the infrastructure level. So uh, I, uh, Jeremy Keith, who is a, uh, a web developer in the UK, um, he's got a lot of material around, um, uh, around building robust uh, websites and robust experiences. And he sets out these like principles of identifying the core functionality for a particular website and making that functionality available using the simplest possible technology and enhancing upon that. And for my particular use case, like I don't really have to deal with the problem set of old browsers because I build UIs for, uh, for people working on the web. So I know everyone's running latest Chrome or latest Firefox. Like I see all the analytics for that. That's not my major problem set. But one of my major problem sets is that I want to be able to, as a engineer who works at a chaos engineering startup, I want to think about how I can make our UI as robust as possible in these situations where our systems may be under duress. Like we've got to practice what we preach. So I wanted to try and think about this of like, what is the core functionality for every page that I have and what functionality may be secondary and how can I uh, primarily just offer the, the simplest uh, functionality on that page and enhance upon it? So I wanted to use this quick Netflix example because I think um, it's, it's not simplicity in UI, but I think it's like really interesting in terms of the way that uh, this fallback works. So this is, uh, this is my boss's Netflix personalized page. And uh, I really enjoy putting it in because it's like the continue to watch. Like, it's like, what do we got? It's like mermaids and My Little Pony and like, you know, no judgment. He, he's got kids. He's got like lots of kids. So it checks out, but you know. Um, but in any case, like what is, what is the primary functionality of this page? Can I get a, a hand from anyone? What's the primary functionality of the page? Yep. So the primary functionality of the page is to choose some kind of video content, right? A secondary functionality on this page is that it relates to um, a particular user, it's personalized. So the order is set for, you know, the idea that you, you continue to watch um, the stuff that you've already 
been uh, watching before. And then potentially like a second row might be things that relate to um, like, like suggested titles based on previous things that you've been interested in. So when I look at this page, I'm like, uh, like a really good question would be like, what if the service goes down that relates to um, personalized content? And they've got a fallback for it. They just offer generic content. So like there is a simplicity, like there's just something really magical about the fact that like you come to this page and potentially like the user may not even like notice the difference. Like they may not think through the fact that this isn't personalized content. They may just go to the search figure out like what they want to watch and then watch it. And like the, the experience hasn't really been degraded like that far. And it's really cool that they're still offering that like core functionality there. So I want to talk about like how this all re relates to React. Um, and obviously when we talk about error boundaries, um, we're not talking about like failure from externalities, we're actually talking about failure from child components. So has everyone, has everyone used slash heard of error boundaries before? Can I get a show of hands? Cool, all right, we're pretty well acquainted. Um, so um, yeah, here's like the, the clips notes. So, uh, if you, so if you create an error boundary, it's essentially like a wrapper that affects, it, it essentially catches any errors that you get from child components. Um, but what's really interesting about them is that it's like, it's a little bit dangerously simple. Like, it's really important to be really conscious of where you place those error boundaries. And I want to explain that. So here you can see like, this is basically uh, kind of like how the catch works. So you get a, a method for get derived state from error. And that essentially is where you can update your state for this particular component. And then component did catch where you can uh, potentially log that error as well. So no magic going on here. Um, it can only be written in class components as well. Um, oh, and I shamelessly just like rip this out of the docs because the docs are awesome for this. So if you look to implement this later, um, that's worth checking out. So like this is an example of like so this isn't like real, obviously, like I didn't, <laughs> I don't know how Twitter implements error boundaries, but uh, what I wanted to like note with this was the idea that if, if, if there was some kind of like error state that happened within like, say like a tweets following followers component, if something happened there, we could catch it and just emit that data and the user would potentially be none the wiser. So that, that, that feels like a pretty decent experience. That doesn't seem that bad. But here's one that would like really kind of piss me off, right? Like I'm here, like imagine if like a component for the, the plus and tweet, like there's some kind of error in that and it gets caught, but it kind of like gets caught at the level of the, the whole, um, like where I'm writing my tweet area. I don't like the tweet form, let's say that. Um, if it gets caught there, like I spend, let's say I spend like five minutes, like crafting the perfect tweet, like just something that's beautiful. And, and then like, I go to send it. I'm like, uh Oh, like I can't send this tweet. And then I got to go through the experience of like copying and pasting it or like, I got to figure out something else. It's like, it's the horrible user experience. So like, in this particular instance, I've like caught, I've caught the error, right? And I've caught it at a pretty like low level. So you're like, all right, it's, you know, I'm wrapping like a very small portion of the site. That makes sense. But like what would actually be a better experience is if I omitted the entire form. So in that way, it's like really important to start thinking about which parts of your site you actually want to use error boundaries on because it's actually a huge UX concern. And if you want to dig into that a little bit more, um, Brandon Dale, who I believe works at uh, Facebook, has a blog post on this particular topic um, that is really awesome. He goes through like a lot of the UX concerns and like how to how to like break up your pages and really think about errors in a um, uh, 
in a way that like is going to be really empathetic to the user. So um, I want to kind of like really emphasize the fact that like I you know I work at a chaos engineering tooling startup. Uh, we have uh, products for like injecting failure into infrastructure and into applications, but like if we aren't working with customers that actually care about the user experience around error handling, like it's all for naught. Like it's really important that uh, having like a sense of empathy around the way, like the way that systems are going to fail and the way that's going to affect your users, because failure is inevitable. Like that's the one constant you can expect in life. Um, it's it's just really important to like have a sense of empathy around like what your final experience is going to look for, look like for users and really like index for that. Um, if you're really interested in chaos engineering, like this is like piqued your interest, you want to get into it. Um, I would point you to the, uh, we have like a, a link to, it's not really affiliated with the company, but uh, it's a chaos engineering Slack channel. Um, so there's like a lot of, I think there's like, oh, sorry. There's like 2,000 people on it. I thought I had the figure there, but I don't. Um, I think it's 2,600 people, just like all talking about chaos engineering. They're from like all different levels of the stack, caring about all different things, but it's like those kind of principles tie everyone together, which I think is really cool. So one thing I actually omitted from this was I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, I want to show you this. So when I was running my first game day, let me just like backtrack a second because I missed this slide and I think it's like um, something I actually really want to talk about. Um, so when I was running my first game day with people, um, we were, were running it on the infrastructure and everything broke and everything sucked. And and then like I went back and I was like, well, I can't just like repro this, right? Like I can't repro bringing down our infrastructure to figure out how to remediate failure in the UI because like I'm just going to piss everyone off. Um, so, and we're running this against staging at the time. So like what I wanted to figure out is like how can I, um, as a UI engineer, like repro a lot of these situations and um, and like deal with this failure that's happening on an application level, even though the failure is being injected at the infrastructure level. And luckily enough for us, we came out, like we built this new like product um, that was externally available, uh, which was an application level failure injection tool. Um, and it was like, it was API first. So I built a Chrome extension on top of it that would essentially like give me um, all the endpoints that I could hit, which you can see. Oh yeah, there we go. You can see them just up and down here. So, um, and I want to tell just like a really brief story about this, but I was like, I was failing some, I was like trying to uh, put together some demos for this and I was failing all these like different endpoints and I actually like hit some error states in my UI that I didn't expect were gonna be there. Um, I failed like a metadata endpoint and it actually like crashed the like cr attack creation page. So you can see here like this is an error boundary just around here that we have like surrounding the content part of the page. And, uh, and yeah, I'd actually just broken this and I can't actually, sh I wanted, I really w badly want to show you that. And then I realized that there was like critical um, information on that that I like for security reasons I couldn't show, which is like super annoying. But I broke the app today trying to create demos for this. And then uh, we were running a chaos experiment like uh, two weeks ago. And, um, and I, like, we're doing it on infrastructure as well. And the user sessions um, endpoint, anytime we would get a 500 from it, it would it'd sign us out. But I couldn't actually figure out which endpoint was failing at the time. So, um, so like I had to go back and I like 
would inject failure. You can see here, oh no, get away. There we go. So I'd put like, this is what happens if I inject 10 seconds of latency. Oh, that, and there's Tammy telling me that I did a good job dog fooding. So this is 10 seconds of latency into the entire, into our application if you fail the user sessions. And then it, if it's an exception as well, like if it generates a 500, it logs them out, which I'm still trying to figure out. That's a pretty critical endpoint for our entire application. Um, but that kind of speaks to the fact that like by doing this and by just like failing all this different stuff, I can go back and just like think, think backwards and be like, well, what's critical? Like, what do we really need to surface to be able to display this page and what's secondary? Like, what can I offset to later? And by going through this process, I can kind of deal with that. Um, I was planning on showing you that halfway through the talk, but you know, I'm dealing with failure all the time. And that was just one more <laughs> example of it. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for having me. This is really good fun. Sure. Do, um, does anyone have any questions for Patrick? Because it was perfect. That's right. Yeah. Excellent job, Patrick. Thank you for coming. You. Thanks all of you for coming tonight. Thanks to Nerd Wallet for hosting a great event. And I hope you all have a swell evening. See you next month. <laughs>